So if we are all uh, ready, uh, I'm I'm going to start. Uh, Andrea, uh, there is a uh, an update. Uh, Napisa couldn't attend him uh, because of his her uh, COVID. Uh, so uh, please uh, skip. Who's not attending? Sorry. Napisa. Napisa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Okay, uh, as um, as you were uh, as you were already been told, uh, with your permission, the panel will be recorded. Um, so uh, also um, it will be also uh, available in the future for uh, uh, this ACPS website. Now, um, welcome to the seventh panel of the Mapping Global Populism uh, panels organized by ACPS, the European Center for Populism Studies and its partners. Uh, the ECPS organizes a uh, panel series to discuss the state of political populism in different regions. After concluding our Mapping European Populism panels, we decided to discuss populism beyond the borders of Europe by expanding our panel series to global populism. Uh, we aim to have a complete picture of populism around the globe with monthly sessions throughout the year. Uh, we began our panel series discussing the far right in Australia in March 2023, in April when analyzed illiberalism in the Philippines. Uh, the third panel was on religious populism and radicalization in Indonesia. The fourth discussed populism in India, followed by the fifth that was analyzing Pakistan's current political climate and authoritarianism. The sixth and seventh panels uh, zoomed in on Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, the reports and videos of each panel are published on our website and YouTube channel too. Uh, the panel reports and recordings are invaluable sources for scholars, policymakers, the broader audience, and anyone concerned by the current challenges to democracy in the world posed by populist populi uh, politics. Uh, please, uh, um, if you are interested, check our YouTube channel for the panel series and other SCPS programs. Uh, today, we will have our seven sessions of the Mapping Global Populism series. These sessions of the Mapping Global Populism series will examine democracy in Thailand. Uh, we are very grateful for all the scholars, experts, activists, and diplomats that are sharing their ideas uh, and work and wisdom in our panel series. Uh, being said that, uh, let me uh, introduce all the moderators and panelists today. Uh, but before introducing them, uh, if I'm not uh, pronouncing correctly some names, please feel free to tell me uh, because uh, I'm not taking for granted uh, because of the distance of the language that I'm saying uh, your names correctly. So really feel free to, to stop me and say, no, well, the pronunciation is, uh, is different. Uh, so uh, to, uh, to continue, our, our moderator and our first speakers uh, is uh, Dr. Michael Montesano. Uh, his uh, research expertise is on uh, the economic and social history of modern Southeast Asia and its legacies, Thailand, the Philippines, Myanmar, and province, provincial Southeast Asia. He developed these interests uh, while serving as a United States Peace Corps volunteer in South Thailand, uh, and he studied agriculture at the University of the Philippines at Las Banos. Uh, Dr. Montesano is an associate or senior fellow at uh, ICS. Uh, Yusuf Ishak Institute, where he served at, as a coordinator of the Thailand Studies Program and co-coordinator of the Myanmar Studies Program at uh, ICS. Um, he worked for six years as managing editor of the Journal of Social Issues in Southeast Asia. All, moreover, his ongoing research concerns Bangkok's relations uh, with the Thai provinces in the 20th and 21st century. It also examines the activities of business firms and banks, ideological constructs used to map provincial society uh, and questions of local political economy and political organization. Um, he published on elections, ethnic relations, militaries of Myanmar and Thailand, the future of Thailand after the coup and other pieces on the region. Uh, Dr. Michael Montesano will have an overall assessment of democracy in Thailand, uh, navigating populism and authoritarianism. Our second uh, panelist and speaker is Dr. Petra Alderman. Um, and the title of her speech is Political Legitimation and Authoritarian Nation Branding in Thailand. Dr. Alderman is a country specialist in Thailand. 
She is also currently a postdoctoral research fellow in leadership for inclusive and democratic politics at the University of Birmingham uh, in the UK and a research fellow of, uh, at the Center uh, of, for Elections, Democracy, Accountability and Representation. Uh, she also joined the University of Birmingham in December uh, 2021 after two years at the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies uh, and the Department of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark where she worked as a postdoctoral research fellow. Dr. Aldermart uh, completed the PhD at the University of Blitz, uh, and her areas of expertise uh, uh, are including democratic and authoritarian politics, with a special interest in elections and nation branding, and also uh, on a geographical focus, geographic focus on Southeast Asia. Uh, she's also the editor of the People, Power, Politics podcast, um, interviewing scholars about uh, on democracy, authoritarian politics, and elections. And also, uh, she's a regular host on the Nordic Asia podcast and Thailand Social Science Seminar Series. Um, uh, unfortunately, we, uh, as uh, I've been told, uh, uh, Dr. Napisa is not joining us, so I'm going to present uh, uh, the, our third speaker, uh, that is uh, Mr. Isakul Hanahate, um, uh, Ms. Hanakate uh, has a recorded a pre-recorded presentation uh, because unfortunately he wasn't able to uh, to join us in in our panel. But the presentation, um, the title of the presentation is "Authoritarian Minister of Truth: A Case of Thailand's Anti-Fake News Center." Uh, uh, the, Mr. Hanakate is a lecturer at the Faculty of Economics, um, Tamasat University, and a PhD researcher working on the political economy of fake news in Thailand at the University of Sydney. He's also a researcher at the Thailand Development Research Institute. Next, uh, for our last speaker, uh, the presentation is about the youth perspective. Uh, the presentation is uh, given by uh, Patanun uh, Arun uh, And uh, the research question of the presentation is, uh, is populism for the people? and is seeking uh, a response in an eco-feminist movement from Thailand. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Arun Prehavat uh, has a master's degree, uh, is interested in gender equality and climate justice, and uh, uh, has a master's degree uh, from, uh, from Lu Ken uh, Ye a School of Public Policy Executive Education uh, in Public Policy, and has been working as a researcher, writer, and leader with the uh, Young Asian Leaders Policy Initiative, besides other uh, collaborations with other think tanks and companies in the region. Uh, as a final reminder, I would like to, um, to tell you and to know that we are going to have a, a Q&A session after the completion of uh, the presentations. So uh, feel free to write your questions in the chat box or raise your virtual hands uh, and pose your questions in person. Uh, now, uh, having um, presented all the panelists and speakers, I would like to uh, give the floor uh, to our first uh, panelist and moderator, Dr. Michael Montesano, uh, that is uh, presenting us and is starting with an overall assessment of democracy in Thailand, navigating populism and authoritarianism. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. And I want to thank the European Center for Populism Studies for giving me the chance to participate in today's panel. I want to give special thanks to Dr. Bulan Kenes for making my own participation possible today. I see, as Andrea has noted, that today is the seventh session in a series on mapping global populism. The global focus of this series makes very clear that its agenda include understanding similarities and exploring differences among variants of what is deemed populism. That is, the undertaking is implicitly comparative. Almost 50 years ago, the anthropologist Herbert Phillips quoted the political scientist David Wilson saying about Thailand, what damn good is this country? You can't compare it with anything. Excuse me, I've lost my camera. Strictly speaking, an idea like that is, of course, ridiculous. The study of Thailand, like the study of any place else, has much to gain from comparative perspectives. At the same time, it's impossible to talk about putting Thailand in comparative perspective without making an effort to 
understand isms like populism and authoritarianism in the local context. We need to ground our understanding of these Thai isms before we can set up about performing a comparative project. So I want to talk a little bit about Thai populism and about Thai authoritarianism in some historical context. The first task, talking about populism in Thailand is actually easier than talking about authoritarianism in Thailand. Populism essentially entered the Thai political lexicon just more than 20 years ago. With the accession of Thaksin Chinawat to the premiership, his Thai Rak Thai party, which took power in 2001, earned electoral success with a program of extravagant and apparently not particularly well-designed programs targeting, above all, rural ties. These programs involved a moratorium on farm debt, village development funds, and extremely low-cost access to health care. At the time that Thaksin's government took power and began to implement these policies, many commentators, above all in the press, considered these programs for the welfare of people in rural Thailand unprecedented. These commentators were, however, terribly misinformed. They overlooked the policies introduced by the short-lived mid-1970s government of Prime Minister Kukret Pramod and his finance minister, Bunchu Rachanastatien. Nevertheless, while those earlier initiatives faded in subsequent decades, it was the Thaksin government of 2001 to 2006 that injected into the Thai political bloodstream parallels deemed populist. In this sense, a crude comparison between Thaksin and one of my personal heroes, General Juan Domingo Perón, is applicable. That is, we see the insertion into a polity's bloodstream for the long haul of populist mentalities by the on the part of one particularly strong figure. Since Thaksin and his party introduced populist ideas and populist programs into the Thai political bloodstream, policies deemed populist have been mimicked in the platforms of almost all Thai political parties and even by the grubby military dictatorship that took power in Bangkok in 2014. It's crucial to understand the reason for this development. The reason that populism only gained currency as an idea in Thai politics and in the Thai political lexicon after 2001. Fundamentally, it was that Thaksin matched his programs with rhetoric and behavior, stressing his unmediated relationship with the Thai people. Thaksin was, that is, populist in a way that Kukrit Pramot was not. And this unmediated relationship with the Thai people that he invoked was, needless to say, perceived by many in the Bangkok elite as a challenge to another figure who had or sought to have unmediated relations with the Thai people, that is, the monarch. This question of mediation, or the lack thereof, between the people and the government is central not only to populism in Thailand, but also to manifestations of authoritarianism in the country. As I said a moment ago, understanding Thai authoritarianism is more difficult than understanding Thai populism. It's very difficult to date the onsets of authoritarianism in Thailand. Does it date, for example, from the early 1890s, when King Chulongkorn reformed the, the, the polity, the government, to endow royal absolutism with power that it had never enjoyed before. Or to the 1930s, when a small civilian military faction abolished the Thai absolute monarchy. Or perhaps to the long series of military governments that, from just before the Pacific War up to the very recent past, have given the country the reputation for coups and dictatorships that it has today. We don't need to, un to answer these questions, to make a choice among these 
starting points for the onset of Thai authoritarianism, authoritarianism to observe that both in the 1930s with the demise of the absolute monarchy and in the Cold War era of anti-communist military dictatorship, Thai authoritarianism was in fact centered on the same concerns as Toxinite populism. What do I mean? The faction of civil servants and soldiers that seized power from the absolute monarchy in 1932 did so in the name of the people. The crucial counterinsurgency doctrine that, the, that a military-led government in Bangkok unveiled in 1980 espoused a version of democracy that was also rooted in an unmediated relationship between the state and the people, a vision in which political parties vying for electoral support did not really figure in an important way. Even the seemingly hapless military dictatorship of 2014 to 2019 inherited the ab obsolescent thought regarding the relationship of the state to the Thai people of the counterinsurgency era. We must therefore understand Thai authoritarianism as something that is much more than just a matter of military rule or even dictatorial rule on behalf of powerful social and economic interests. Thai authoritarianism has often been grounded in an effort to respond to the same need that undergirds Thai populism, the need to forge ties between the demos and the state without the mediating structures of liberal democracy. With that, I pass the torch to our first speaker on the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for the really great opening remarks. So I am going to, in this presentation, be talking a little bit more about the authoritarianism in Thailand. So um, once again, thank you very much for this amazing opportunity to present my work on this panel. It's a great honor to be talking alongside these brilliant Thailand colleagues and um, scholars. And I'm very excited to be able to share with you some insights from my recently published book. So as you can see, the book is titled Branding Authoritarian Nations, Political Legitimation and Strategic National Myths in Military Rule Thailand. Um, it is a mouthful, I know, <laughs> but um, the book was published in July this year, and it is a result of several years of work, both during and after my PhD. Essentially, this book is about nation branding in authoritarian contexts and while I am using the example of Thailand, specifically the period under the latest military rules, so the rule of the National Council for Peace and Order, um, the core ideas that I develop in this book can be used to understand why and how other authoritarian regimes brand themselves. But before I delve into my presentation, let me briefly exp uh, explore what nation branding is. And perhaps the the best or the simplest way to do this is to uh, by looking at an example. Some of you might be familiar with, with this example, but uh, basically this is a, one of the posters from the Great Britain campaign, which was launched back in 2015 under the, the government of um, David Cameron. And um, if you travel to the UK by plane, you might still see um, similar posters like this one, um, you know, sort of along the corridors of various airport buildings. Now, the campaign was originally presented as a tourism focused campaign, but um, soon enough, it kind of branched out into the different sectors and different industries as well. And that's typically what we think of when we talk about nation branding. So it's this kind of unified way of trying to present or represent country through, I mean, typically it comes with some kind of slogan like Great Britain and Britain is great, um, or um, through logos and some visuals as well. Um, tourism is typically the most visible aspect of nation branding, but it is not the only one. So let's leave James Bond behind for now and turn back to 
my book. Um, no James Bond in there, I'm afraid. Um, but um, the idea that nations can be branded like products or corporations basically originated in the late 1990s in American and British branding circles, um, British um, marketing and branding circles. British branding consultant Simon Anhold is typically seen as the father of, of this practice, so father of nation branding, and he was certainly one of the most ardent supporters or proponents of this practice in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Now, since then, many countries across the socioeconomic spectrum um, and, you know, at different sort of ends of regime times, as you could see with the, the UK campaign, have adopted nation branding and reinvented themselves in these brand terms. The original idea behind nation branding was that, you know, countries should take up this, uh, this practice to improve their global competitiveness. So it was something that, you know, you would do in order to attract more tourists, um, let's say more, more um, investors, um, you know, um, get, let's say, a, a particular or plug a particular gap in your labor market by attracting foreign workforce and so on and so forth. And um, because of this, we often tend to think about nation branding as something that countries do for the outside world. So it's it's meant for the outside, other the foreign other rather than the internal self. And we think about it as a form of image projection aimed at attracting either investors, tourists, workforce, or whatever you want to put in there. But this preoccupation with the external image projection means that we have overlooked the domestic dimension of nation branding. And this is, as I argue in my book, a very serious oversight, especially when it comes to authoritarian regimes like military rule Thailand. You might be thinking, you know, what do I mean by nation, branding, nation branding's domestic dimension? A good way to illustrate this is to um, bring up the analogy of corporate branding. So when it comes to branding a corporation, Creating an appealing outside image is only, only a small part of this branding exercise. For any corporation or corporate branding to be successful, you first of all need to get, you know, people who work for the corporation, so the corporation's employee, to actually behave in ways that are compatible with the external brand image that you seek to promote to the outside world. So essentially, you need these people to live the brand. And this is where nation branding becomes particularly attractive to authoritarian regimes, because you're trying to get your population to live the brand and behave in um, ways that are compatible with the brand image that you seek to promote. So this brings me to three core ideas that I would like to share with you today and that I discuss at length in the book. So the first idea is that despite its seemingly lighthearted and superficial nature, you know, like the bond image, nation branding is actually a deeply political practice that we should try and study and understand much better than what we are doing right now. The second idea um, is that we need to change the way we think about nation branding. There is far too much tendency to focus on its external manifestations rather than its domestic workings. And I will speak to this more throughout the presentation. And the final third idea is that um, we need to start taking authoritarian nation branding much more seriously by looking at it through the prism of political legitimation. Over the past few years, authoritarian regimes have become much more sophisticated in how they go about controlling their populations. So, you know, of course, there is always a level of repression or co-optation, and that is unlikely to go um, away anytime soon. But at the same time, these regimes also engage in soft practices like nation branding to help establish their legitimation claims. There is plenty of great scholarship on this topic by scholars such as Alagapa, Egeling, Morgan Besser, or Guriev and Treisman, to name just a few. But let me um, reiterate that we need to stop nation uh, stop viewing nation branding as a frivolous beauty contest that um, you know countries engage in, and look at it as a serious practice that masks often a deeper con connection to domestic power politics and legitimation needs. Nation branding's legitimation potential rests in its ability to produce what I call in the book strategic national myths. 
So the concept of strategic national myths that I um, um, uh, create in the book is basically inspired by the work of um, Alistair Miskimen, Benon Laughlin and La Laura Rosell on strategic narratives. So this concept of strategic narratives um, is quite popular and well known within international relations. And while it doesn't have a domestic dimension, I have found it quite useful to think about um, nation branding. So building on this work, I came up with the concept of strategic national myths, which I define as specific kinds of applied national myths that are selective interpretations of the nation's past and its present character and contain elements of future vision and aspirations, which are typically underpinned by a mixture of political, economic and cultural goals. Now, the strategic character is reflected in the way that these myths seek to influence perceptions of the nation's elite and their interests and how domestic power arrangements work and should work. So, um, you know, there's quite a lot that can be loaded into these strategic national myths. Um, before we can discuss what nation branding looked like under the National Council for Peace and Order, it is important to contextualize this practice in Thailand. So Thailand was an early adopter of nation branding. Um, you might remember me saying um, in one of the earlier slides that the idea that nations can be branded like products or corporations originated in the late 1990s. Um, well, Thailand actually adopted nation branding during the premiership of Taksin Shinawat, which is from the 2001 and 2006, as Mike has mentioned. One of the reasons why actually Thailand adopted nation branding so readily was because of Taksin's um, business oriented approach to politics and the fact that he surrounded himself, himself with many marketers who had studied in the United States under some of the leading proponents of nation branding at that time. I'd like to mention just two people here. So Dr. Somkit Jatosripitak and Dr. Suid Mesinsi, both of whom earned their PhDs from um, the Northwestern University in the United States. And they were actually both su supervised by Philip Kotler, who is um, uh, one of the leading figures in marketing and was a, a huge proponent of nation branding at the time. So Sonkid and Suvid played a pivotal role in taxing era nation branding and in building of what I call in the book, the nation economy taxing brand. So that kind of goes back to what Mike was talking about, taxing populism. The nation economy taxing brand offered um, an alternative strategic national myth to the conservative triadic expression of um, Thai national identity, which is typically formulated as this nation religion king triad. Um, and this traditional nation religion king triad is underpinned by principles of deference, obedience, and strict social hierarch hierarchization. So in contrast, the nation economy taxing brand was about a successful and competitive Thailand that would be full of business-minded people and you know, the country would become or be on par with Western industrialized nation. And this was very much about ambition, progress, and no limits to one's socioeconomic mobility. So you can really see why um, it became so popular with certain sections of Thai society. And I would say an important caveat here is that this doesn't actually mean that Taksin really maybe cared himself about all these things, but this is the vision or the brand that he created for the Thai people. Now, the Taksin's government approach to nation branding was in many ways a textbook approach. So basically, he hired an international consultant who created a unified nation branding strategy, and then Taksin was trying to implement it. Now, this is how nation branding um, was done then um, um, under all pro-taxing governments that came into power after Taksin's downfall in the 2006 military coup. To illustrate this approach, I like showing the modern Thailand nation branding campaign that was launched by the government of Yinglak Shinawat, who um, is Taksin's younger sister. So this was the last elected government before the May 2014 coup, when the NCPO seized power. So for, for this particular campaign, the Yinglak government hired a global consultancy called Wing, Cre Wing Creative, 
Um, and Wing Creative created a new branding strategy for Thailand that came with a new country logo, which you can see here. Um, and by the way, if you're wondering um, what the logo rep represents, it is supposed to be an elephant. It took me a while to see that. But um, once I think once you know that it's an elephant, you can see that there quite easily. Here are some images for the different sectors um, um, for, for, um, for this particular campaign. Now, there were plenty of plans for the Modern Thailand campaign outputs. Um, there were um, magazines, billboards, um, and there was also even a, a shop concept somewhere in um, Japan, I think was um, where it was meant to be. But the project was cut short by the 2014 military coup and the rise of the NCPO. The NCPO did not continue working with Wing Creative and they basically discontinued the entire modern Thailand campaign. But this doesn't mean that nation branding just stopped. Um, the NCPO adopted a different approach because they had different needs. As a government that came to power through military coup, the NCPO lacked popular legitimation. And so Thailand's post-coup nation, post nation branding was very different to its pre-coup version. The NCPO did not hire an, uh, an international consultancy, but in many ways they actually didn't need to. So since the early days of the coup, the NCPO or the generals were basically advised by Somkit and Suwit, so the two Taxinera marketers. Somkit and Suwit became, later became um, um, cabinet members and the driving force behind many of these nation branding campaigns under the NCPO, especially the ones that were in the economic um, area. Um, so some of these projects, and I'll talk about one of them a little bit um, in a bit, bit more detail later on, was the Thailand 4.0. Another project was, for example, Pracharat. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much depth about the NCPO's approach to nation branding, which is what I analyze in the book. But one of the things that I would like to highlight here is that the NCPO approached nation branding as a form of information operations. So this was very much about targeting enemies and trying to change their mindset. Now, in the Thai case, the enemy is, in most cases, the domestic audience. Um, so in this respect, it was you know, all those ties who did not support the coup and who were against the NCPO. So here you can see some examples of nation branding under the NCPO. And um, it is very different, as you can see, from the modern Thailand campaign. So in the book, I argue that um, when it came to post-coup nation branding, the NCPO's aim was to delegitimize the nation economy taxing brand and reorient people back to the more conservative ex expression of Thai identity represented by the nation religion king triad. To this end, the NCPO created a new strategic national myth of a creatively modernizing, but culturally and socially traditional Thailand where Thai people would reject the Shinawats and where they would reject their provincial identities and domestic and social aspiration in exchange for a semi-authoritarian rule under the NCPO and the conservative Thai elite, which is obviously the military, the monarchy and some of the senior bureaucracy. So we now know that this actually didn't work um, considering what, what has been happening in Thailand over the past few years. But this does not take away the fact that the NCPO actually tried to do all these things. So let me illustrate with Thailand 4.0, which was a rather short-lived project that was launched sometime in March or April 2016 as Thailand's flagship economic policy. It was designed by Suid Mesinsi and it had a strong external element. So this was the time when much of the world was talking about moving towards Industry 4.0 and actually many countries were launching policies that were branded in this particular way. So by launching this Thailand 4.0 policy, the NCPO was sending a strong signal um, abroad that Thailand was following this global economic trend and um, that it was a great place to invest. But at the same time, the Thailand 4.0 policy um, also had a strong internal element. And it sounded very much like um, 
something that a taxing government would do or would launch. And you can see the poster for the um, Talent 4.0 policy right here. Now, Talent 4.0 was always presented as an economic policy, but it turned out that this was not all that much about the economy or the industry, but rather about political legitimation for the NCPO. And I found this infographic and I really like showing this. Um, it was actually on Suvit's public Facebook page. And um, the reason why I like showing it is because the story that this infographic tells is basically an apt reflection of what the Talent 4.0 policy was really about. So there were actually more pictures than what I'm going to show in this presentation. And you still will be able to find the full, full story on Facebook. But um, basically this, is, um, this infographic story is called um, Thailand 4.0 policy for an easy comprehension. And it is about a Thai man, Thai man um, who conspicuously looks like um, um, like Junta leader, now former Prime Minister Prai Chan Ota. Um, in the story, Prayut is visited by his future self, which you can see right here. And um, his future self basically comes from this 4.0 era and tells the present day Prayut that Thailand's future depends on him. And um, the future Prayut basically describes the Thailand 4.0 age as an age of security, wealth and sustainability and shows present day Prayut images of um, old people aided by robots and um, you know, Thai farmers being able to sell their produce directly on the market by using modern day technology. Now, the future prior then basically tells present day prior that he is the man to lead Thailand towards this exciting 4.0 future. Now, this infographic story and the entire Thailand 4.0 policy was basically selling an appealing vision of future to the Thai people in exchange for their support, trust and loyalty to the military government, so to the NCPO. It was part of the post-coup strategic national myth, basically the one part that was about the economic modernization. And it was not just, um, and he was basically saying that, you know, it is not just taxing who can deliver all these exciting economic visions, but NCPO can actually do the same. But for the vision to work, Thai people also needed to work together with the NCPO to help deliver this um, 4.80 age. So this is what I mean by the NCPO using nation branding as a strategy for political legitimation. I think I'm kind of, I overran the time here, so I took a bit of a liberty, but given that we have a less, well, we don't have the full panel, so hopefully this is okay, but um, we can discuss some of these things um, in more details during the Q&A, but thank you very much for the time and the opportunity to present. Thank you, Dr. Alderman. And with that, I think we now have a recorded talk. Is that right, Andrea? Yes, uh, it is right. Uh, we also uh, wish to um, uh, please, uh, the third speaker, unfortunately, as I, as I told you, uh, is not coming because uh, she has COVID. Uh, so we wish her a speedy recovery. And now we are going for the recorded um, uh, panel. Uh, that is uh, from, um, uh, it's a cool Hanakate, uh, and is about authoritarian Ministry of Truth, a case of Thailand Scientific News Center. Hello, everyone. My name is Itsuku Nunaget. Uh, today, I will be presenting a part of my dissertation. This presentation is about the uh, Ministry of Truth, a uh, case study of Thailand's anti-fake news center. I would like to thank you, the, the European Center for Populism Studies, uh, to give me the chance to present in this uh, seminar. We acknowledge the tradition of custodianship and law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. We pay our respects 
to those who have care and continue to care for the country. My main question in this presentation is how does the state uh, do fact check? The outline is uh, I follow uh, research background, uh, data collection, coding process, preliminary findings, and uh, the discussion. For the research background and research gap, many countries throughout the world have experienced fake news. Uh, in light of the significant consequences of fake news, especially the COVID-19 pandemic, many governments have attempted to address the issue to various response. Uh, but uh, this measure against fake news could hinder freedom of expression and democratization, especially in authoritarian regimes. For example, since January 2020, at least 24 countries have introduced criminal laws to control fake news. Moreover, uh, 51 governments have abused both new and pre-existing laws to prosecute people criticizing their policies, whether related to the pandemic. Many studies focus on the impact on civil liberties and freedom of expression. However, only a few research explains the reason behind the use of these responses. Because these responses are different in, in different intrusive forms and affect freedom of expression in different ways. So in my thesis, uh, the research questions are, what explains the variation in the state's response to fake news? And when does the state not take action against fake news? In my thesis, there are four responses to fake news that are direct communication, fact-checking, content removal or blocking, and uh, the last one is criminal sanctions. However, in this presentation, I will focus only on fact-checking, which is the practice of systematic publishing assessment of the validity of claim made by public officials and institutions. With an explicit attempt to identify whether a claim is factual. What is interesting is that uh, in democracy, uh, the democratic country differ from authoritarian ones in their approach to uh, information correction. In democratic regimes, journalists or third party fact checkers typically play the role. Uh, and to avoid partisanship, government may provide support in some cases by funding or coordinating with other independent bodies. For example, the UK Rapid Response Unit is known as a fact checker, but its primary function is to fact and provide information friends to the public and the government. On the other hand, uh, government in authoritarian regime attempt to be Ministry of Truth by establish their own fact checking agencies which cannot be guaranteed to be independent. This can be seen in the cases of the Press Information Bureau in India, Sebanaya in Malaysia, Verificado in Mexico, Fake News Butters in Pakistan, Factually in Singapore, and the Anti-Fake News Center in Thailand. For the data collection in this presentation i collect data uh, from between uh march 2020 until uh, 30 september uh the year 9 2022 This period was the first six months 
after the declaration of a state of emergency under the emergency decree on public administration in emergency situation. This is this announcement was uh, significant because it provided the government with extra administrative power as a result of the COVID-19 epidemic. The Section 9 prohibited the dissemination of this thought information which misleading mislead understanding of the emergency situation to the extent of affecting the security of state or public order or good moral of the people. Uh, moreover, a criminal charge including imprisonment may be brought against uh, an offender. So, fact checker, especially if they control ones, must have played a vital part. I collect data from two, two fact checkers. The first one is uh, the anti fake news center, and uh, which uh, operate under the uh, Ministry of Digital, Economic, and Society. Another one is the AFP Thailand, which is the, uh, the only uh, telepathy fact checker that is accredited by the IFCN, the, the International Fact Checking Network. This is uh, the website of the anti fake news center. And another one is the website of the AFP Thailand. This is the number of the report that I collect during the, the period mentioned. For the coding process, I use the anti fake news, uh, sorry, uh, the international fact checking network code. Uh, uh, the, the principal concern with the integrity of fact checking methodology, mainly the uh, non partisan and trans transparent. Uh, in other words, uh, fact checkers must justify why and how they fact check, such as why they choose the claim and how they assess it. So this is the start of my, uh, my, uh, data collection. Uh, I use qualitative methods using NVivo and, uh, content analysis by comparing the pattern of AFNC and AFP report. Uh, to assess why and how they fact check uh, for the uh, uh, four elements that is topic, resources, references, and outcomes. I will go through this quickly. This is a topic. Uh, this is a source of claim. Uh, is it where the the fact checker collect uh, uh, the claim? And this is uh, the sources of reference. Uh, how they uh, know that is the claim is true or false. And this is the outcome whether the claim is false, misleading, or true. For the finding, the first one is the, the AFNC report. Um, the topic of the claim in fact check report from the AFNC during the first three months following the announcement of the emergency decree were heavily focused on the government's policy or measures regarding COVID-19 and the emergency decree and relating regulation as well as the prevention and the treatment of coronavirus disease. Uh, the topic from the AFNC chief over the next three months with health topic dominating. During the same time, the claim topic in fact check report from AFP Thailand follows similar pattern to those of the, the AFNC. Uh, however, uh, it is worth noting that certain issues such as protests were covered in AFP Thailand report, but not in the AFNC. Uh, for example, the old photo of former U.S. Ambassador with 
Thai student leader who used to claim foreign involvement in protests. This is uh, the, uh, the one that uh, the AFP Thailand do fact check, but uh, not in the report by the uh, state control FNC. In terms of the, the source of claims, uh, the anti fake news center does not specify where the claims are from. Yeah, uh, is, uh, is, uh, the FNC almost uh, the report have uh, unspecified sources and use unclear phrase. The, uh, the, Project report with unspecified source are trouble, troublesome, especially in terms of transparency, because we cannot pack the claim back to the original source and just their significant. I think at best the AFNC may select a less important claim, then there is an effective fact checking. At worst, uh, it may fabricate a claim or be utilized as a conduit for the government agendas, uh, I will elaborate more in the, the, the outcome section. For the source of reference, um, why uh, FP Thailand employs various sources, uh, the uh, AFNC, uh, uh, government agency and officials are nearly the sole sources of reference in the AFNC publication with the Ministry of Public Health sending out. This appears to be reasonable given that uh, numerous claims on health and wellness issues and uh, uh, government health related policy and measure, including the managing, uh, the management during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, uh, some cases are clearly controversial. This is a report that the Ministry of Public Health conceals the, the amount of COVID-19 test wait list, which the anti fake News Center fact check with the Department of Disease Control under the, the Ministry of Public Health. Uh, there is no doubt that the AFNC report then concludes that the claim is for the outcome, uh, there are significant differences between the two factual reports. Uh, approximately one sixth of the claim uh, in the FNC report are uh, deemed true, uh, but none are in FFP. Uh, the AFP Thailand report. What is interesting is that uh, the uh, when the PRD, the the Department of Public Relations, is the uh, source of reference in the AFNC report, uh, the claim are uh, lastly about uh, government policy. Uh, in particular, the cabinet resolution. Uh, for example, uh, um, this one is the uh, cabinet appointed the 4th and 7th September as substitution holidays for some grand day. Uh, this assessment appears to be more like government announcement than fact check report, and due to the absence of specific sources as discussed. Earlier uh, in the source of claim section, I uh, think we do not know whether the claim exists or where they originated. Uh, from the data collect and uh, uh, primary pre preliminary finding, uh, I think there are. Uh, uh, significant differences between the two factions report. 
um, uh, and if we use the IFCN code of principle uh, as a standard for fact checker, the uh, anti fake news center is a failing fact checker uh, because it's a report at non transparent and biases. So uh, from this, we can see that uh, the anti fake news center may have a hidden goal in addition to its fact checking responsibility. Thank you very much. And if you have a question or comment, you can contact me via my email. Thank you so much. Okay, now I think we can go with the last panelist, that is Patanun uh, Arun Prehevat. Uh, I hope I pronounced it uh, correctly. Um, that is giving a talk on uh, Is Populism for the People from an eco feminist uh, 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 perspective uh, dealing with movements from Thailand. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, let me share my presentation. Okay. Um, so good morning or good evening, everyone. So um, today I will be presenting uh, from the youth perspective. Uh, the title of the presentation is, Is Populism for the People? An Eco-Feminist Movement from Thailand. So um, I think everyone is aware that the term populism is widely cont contested in academia, but um, in this presentation, I will be only focusing uh, on one specific definition, which is uh, populism refers to a set of macroeconomic strategies that prioritizes economic growth, national development, and fair income distribution. So oftentimes, uh, Thai political leaders uh, implement populist policies, mostly framed toward enhancing economic development by targeting the rural poor. Moreover, populists often claim to represent the interests of the people. Uh, there seems to be a generalization of who the people are, but the question is really is who gains and who loses as a result from these populist policies. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm going to focus only on the macroeconomic policy as a part of populism. Uh, there are wide ranges of um, policies that are considered as macroeconomic, but in this presentation, I will be only focusing on the bilateral trade agreements. So the bilateral trade agreements, um, as everyone is probably acknowledged already, um, have both positive impacts and the negative impacts. The positive impacts um, include Include, you know, promoting national growth, uh, creating new jobs, uh, increasing GDP, or attracting foreign investment. On the contrary, uh, trade agreements also have negative impacts, such as environmental degradation, job displacement, unequal distribution, or even land disputes, for example. So my argument here is that I will be using the equal feminism framework. Uh, a disclaimer, I'm not an, ex an expert in equal feminism, but as an equal feminist myself, I this uh, research is purely based on my passion. And for this presentation, I will try to analyze the connection between the environmental issues and the plight of the marginalized group, particularly women and the rural poor, and how certain populist policies entirely disregard the exploitation and oppression of both. And I also argue further that many Thai populist policies are not inclusive, uh, rather they function to benefit only certain groups of people in the society. So what is um, eco-feminism? So the term eco-feminism actually stem from ecology and feminism. So um, many of you might be aware or be familiar with the term feminism, which means that um, the elimination of any factors contributing to continuous systemic domination or subordination of women. And the term ecology often refers to 
um, the environmental philosophy that values all living all living beings for simply existing, not just for their usefulness to humans. And the ecofeminism, uh, according to Karen Barron, the ecofeminist scholar, um, ecofeminism um, refers to the positions that are important connections, historical, exper experiential, symbolic, theoretical between domination of women and the domination of nature. So how did um, ecofeminism come into a conclusion that there is a similarity or there is a parallel connection between the oppression of women and nature? Uh, uh, sorry, the operation of women and nature. So um, they draw from the notion of hierarchical dualism, the notion of this binary opposition that usually dis differentiate between uh, self and other, men and women, culture and nature, uh, logic and emotion, which they usually put um, the other opposite um, spectrum in a higher value or status over the other. So in this case, uh, self over other uh, men over women, culture over nature, and so on and so forth. So um, Karen Warren argued that environmental issues are feminist issues. And this is because uh, the environment forests are usually inextricably connected to the rural and household economies uh, governed by women. So women tend to be more dependent on these natural resources than men, given the social norms and the roles of men and women in the patriarchal world. And therefore, women suffer more than Women as a consequence of environmental degradation or the destruction of the forest, for example. So, besides um, Karen Warren, we have like other scholars um, that um, provide the same uh, argument. For example, Irene Diamond uh, showed that environmental health risks are borne disproportionately by women. Uh, Veneta Shiva also argued that Western maldevelopment programs uh, for emerging nations foster policies that directly or negatively affect women's lives and their ability to care for their children. And lastly, Dean Curtin, for example, argued that developmentalism is a form of systemic violence against women because it tend to overlook uh, women's critical contribution to food production by marginalizing their labor and making it invisible. So um, moving on to the empirical evidence from Thailand. So this is one of the example that I saw the patterns of the domination or the operation of both um, women and nature. So, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, I will be focusing on the bilateral uh, trade agreement. Um, so for this one, for this case specifically, is the Thailand Australian Free Trade Agreement (TAFTA), which was effective in two thousand five. So basically, through this agreement, um, Kingsgate consolidated a com uh, an Australian company received a concession from the Thai government to mine gold ore in three provinces, uh, namely uh, Pijit, Pisanulog, and Pechabun. So what actually went down? So basically, the Accra Resources, also a company, a Thai subsidiary of the Australian mining company, uh, they started operating the mining sites in 2001 in PJ under the project entitled the Chatri Mining Complex. So to give a bit, a, a bit of background of the mining signs is that um, they use a lot of cyanine, which is a to um, toxic uh, chemical substance that is used for extracting the gold. So what happened is that um, the villagers in these uh, local communities, they started noticing um, the health deterioration and the effects, the negative impacts on the environment. So um, some of the villagers filed a lawsuit against the company for violating the National Environmental Quality Act in 2016. 
And, you know, after um, several reports of the negative impacts uh, under the Burger government, like surprisingly, uh, Thailand decided to suspend the mining operation over the health and environmental concerns in 2017. It was kind of like a short win for the villagers and environmental activists. Um, but ultimately, um, Thailand ended up being filed a lawsuit by the King's Gate itself for over 30 million baht or um, 866 million USD um, through the investor state dispute settlement, which is like a privileged form um, from the agreement, which kind of allowed the company, a private sector to sue against the nation. And what happened with this one is that um, the judicial process is completely um, anonymous. Uh, they can, uh, the company or the private sector can uh, pretty much hire um, any lawyers to decide uh, who's right or who's wrong in this case. So um, eventually the Thailand kind of like backtracked and allowed the mining companies to operate, um, which starting this year, 2023. So the consequences um, from these mining sites, I categorize into um, main, three main implications. The first one is the health implications. So according to a lot of like reports and studies, um, they found that uh, there are a lot of like heavy metals exceeding the healthy standard in the villagers' bloodstream. Uh, they also found a high level of cyanide contamination as well. Um, the mining workers also experience in health correlation, for example, ill and muscle twisted. Um, the pregnant woman who just delivered a baby found that um, the baby has a high uh, level of manganese. And the study also found that um, after like a long exposure to toxins via inhalation, it would eventually cause uh, central nervous system toxicity, including weaknesses, headaches, and change in taste and smell. For the environmental implication, um, the mining site, because they have um, they had a toxic leakage into the environment and paddy field, so it's very uh, difficult for um, the villagers, particularly women, to, you know, cultivate the natural resources. Um, there are also a high concentration of metals in the lotus ponds and, you know, resulting, like, as a result from the mining, they also have a lot of, like, noise and air pollution. And for the social implication, um, we found that there is, a, like, a big clash between, uh, you know, national economic development policy and the local community needs and uh, health. Um, there is actually a division between the mining supporters and anti-mining activists, because on one hand, free trade agreement or mining sites uh, create jobs, uh, ultimately in an ideal world, would be able to lift these people out of poverty. But at the same time, they also face uh, a very negative consequences uh, for their health, for example. And what happened in this case particularly is that uh, the company um, paid money to a lot of villagers to relocate from their communities. So at the end of the day, um, not, not many local villagers are left in this community and that the activists who filed the lawsuit against the company, uh, they were charged with defamation. So um, what I just talked about, the pitted case earlier, is not the only environmental justice case in Thailand. We also see a lot of patterns of how um, women uh, women in agriculture or women in um, other provinces are at the forefront uh, fighting against the environmental injustices. Uh, for example, like we have like Conservant Noniwa, they're also against uh, potash mining. Uh, we have uh, women that were against coal power plants. Uh, we have Prajwab Kiri, Kiri Khan, women leader against the coal power plant. And then we have uh, Yanapat, who is a current uh, leader against the mining in that province as well. So in a way, um, these uh, cases do not particularly only affect um, 
women. Uh, they also affect uh, men, uh, elders, uh, children as well. But there is like a solid pattern where, um, particularly in Thailand, we see that, you know, when it comes to fighting against the injustices, uh, usually women are the one who are at the forefront. And it's always women-led uh, initiated um, activism that uh, try to stand up against uh, these um, so far so-called like mal development programs or against the private sectors that you know impose uh, a negative e impacts on them and ultimately these um, process can actually be viewed as um, slow violence in a way that these forms of violences are not so visible um, it kind of affects them in a gradual pace that is hardly not visibly um, detectable um, from the eyes. So here is my uh, conclusion of my presentation. So using the ecofeminism framework, it kind of helped reveal you know, the relationships between the issues of oppression and domination of both the environment and the woman and how this issue cannot be resolved in isolation. Like as you can see, if we want to um, address the gender issues, then we also need to address the environmental issue as well, since these two are um, closely linked. And then the empirical evidence shows how the impact of populist policy, um, particularly the free trade agreement of poor environmental practices on women's lives, uh, the clash of the national economic growth and the rural poor, and how mainstream policy often reflect, reinforce, and create policies that devalue, subvert, or make invisible the actual needs and contribution of women and the underprivileged. Um, thus, the Thai populist policy do not care her to overall um, population. So to make it more clearer, like in this case, we can see that maybe the um, Akka resources or the people who work at um, the Akka resources may have like a better um, economic outcome compared to these rural poor who cannot even uh, rely on natural resources for their livelihoods. And the eco-feminist eco framework helps us rethink the approach towards creating a more space for marginalized in the policy making process to ensure a more equitable society. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Uh, now I think we are done with the presentations so uh, we can uh, begin our q and I, I give the floor our moderator, Michael Montesano, to uh, to guide us towards the Q and A session. And uh, please, if some of you have questions, you're free to to raise your virtual hand or uh, to put them in the in the chat box here in, in Zoom. Um, so feel free to ask and don't be shy. Even. Thank you. I thought that Mr. Seljuk raised his hand. Is that right? Did you raise your hand, sir? No, no, it's it's planned. Okay, okay. Then we will turn to Dr. Buland right away because his his hand is definitely up, sir. You're muted. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Hold on. Excuse me. Uh, actually, my question is for you. Uh, first of all, I thank you for these insightful presentations by Petra and uh, Petanon, uh, and of course, it's so cool. Uh, my question is the, about uh, the, 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 the relations between populism and authoritarianism. Uh, could you please uh, elaborate uh, more about uh, these relations? Uh, where the line uh, between populism ends and uh, authoritarianism begins? or if they can coexist simultaneously. What does the case of Thailand uh, say about the dynamics at the nexus of this populism and uh, authoritarianism? Uh, thank you. 
Well, thank you. I will do the following. Let me offer my own answer, and then I want I want Petra and Patanan to offer their answers too, because my own answer is is slightly idiosyncratic. But I think I think we have to understand that um, for about 140 years now, the the dominant um, issue in Thai governance and politics has been the relationship between Bangkok and its hinterlands. Uh, Patanan talked about marginalized people. She talked about people in the lower north. Um, that's a case in point. Bangkok has been called by many observers the world's greatest example of urban primacy of a primate city. Bangkok is, in historical terms or cultural terms, the seat of the exemplary center, that is where the monarchy uh, that organizes the social hierarchy uh, is located. So the the dilemma in Thailand, and, and there were signs in the most recent Thai election that this might be changing, but the dilemma in Thailand for about 140 years has been crafting means of governance, crafting ideologies of government, governance and structures of governments that serve to make effective the relationship between Bangkok and the provinces and between the leadership in Bangkok and the people who live in the provinces. Now, I would argue from my own rather idiosyncratic perspective that we should see both Thai populism and authoritarianism as answers to this question. And they're different answers because historically, Thai authoritarians have not seen the need to use populist rhetoric, populist approaches. Um, Petra's discussion was extremely enlightening because she dwelt quite a bit on the branding strategy that was used by the most recent military dictatorship. And this was a dictatorship that certainly adopted populist pol policies when it came close to calling an election, but more generally behaved like other military dictatorships. It was heavy handed, it, it was very centralized, it was controlled by a, a number of, of strongmen, but ultimately it was really trying to answer the same need that 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 Thai populism answers. Now, we need to discuss these two isms with reference to another ism, and soon I'll have some questions for Patanan. But one of my one of the other isms that we need to discuss is where liberalism or liberal democracy figures between authoritarianism and populism. And on one level, the answer is very simple, which is that. In liberal democracies, we have a very clear institutional basis for mediation between the state and the people, and that's the political party, competitive political parties. And in the Thai case, and I won't speak globally, but in the Thai case, it's very clear that both populism, even when mobilized by a man like Thaksin, who notionally leads a political party, and authoritarianism, even on the part of juntas that ultimately set up electoral vehicles to contest elections that they finally call, in both those cases, the role of the political party as we understand it in a liberal democratic order is much reduced, reduced to the point of nullity, because in both those cases, there is this determination to craft uh, uh, a relationship between state and 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 people that is not interfered with or mediated by these uh, political parties. Now, I'm not answering your very pointed question, which is where do the two meet, and or where do the two differ? And mm -hmm. I think I think the 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 back of the envelope answer to that question before I pass the baton to. Uh, the other speakers, is that we learn why it was that it was Thaksin Chinawat who introduced 
populism into the political bloodstream in Thailand. And it was it was Thaksin because of the rhetoric he adopted, because of the stress that he placed on doing things for the people. Um, and there's an interesting there's an interesting uh, genealogy of care for interest in the people in Thai politics going back at least as far as 1932, where the group that deposed the absolute monarchy called itself the Kanarasadon, or the People's Party. But there are other notions of the people in Thailand. In 1997, the constitution that allowed uh, uh, Thaksin to score the electoral victory that he did in the next elections called has been seen as the people's constitution. But in in both those cases, there were mediating bodies. The people's constitution involved uh, so-called neutral bodies above politics that would steer the Thai polity. The Kanarasadon originally had a parliament that many of whose members were appointed rather than elections elected. Its original parliament had members who were indirectly elected. So the, the, these, these invocations of the people that predated Thaksin were very different from the form of populism that he introduced into the uh, bloodstream of Thai politics. And I have to say that my own view is that in large part, this is a rhetorical question that the rhetoric that Thaksin used was central to what made him a populist. But having offered that inadequate answer, let's ask Dr. Alderman what she thinks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that was a that was a good um, good evaluation. And I think um, obviously with the rise of Thaksin, um, you know, the people had to. Um, oh, the people became part of the equation within Thai politics, and that sort of forced the hand of all the governments that came after, whether they were military or pro Thaksin, to kind of continue with that. Um, and I think um, from the panel and some of the things that we discussed, um, and I do remember as well that you know having kind of early discussions about um the, the taxing premiership as well and discussing you know to what degree um what he did was actually the true populism in a sense that it sometimes has very negative connotation i mean he he started addressing some of the grievances of the people who had been overlooked for, for many many decades by the, the the sort of the the traditional the more traditional elite so the monarchy military alliance um, obviously, since then, a lot has changed, and you know we we could see it in in various different elections how the the stakes of what's being offered to people and how it's being offered to people keep increasing. So, you know, the latest election in twenty twenty three was uh, in some way a populist concept uh, contest of sorts, where every party was trying to come up with um, a more populist policy uh, almost every week, just to kind of try and attract the vo voters and get the voters. Um, to vote for for their party as opposed to some other party um um and you know that obviously then the the pro tax input high party came up with the um 10,000 um bad digital money which nobody else could have topped because that was uh, you know one of the the very uh kind of a almost like a crazy um out there sort of policy promises that they have made and obviously they're trying to roll with it now but they had to obviously adjust um some of the 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 or you know backtrack maybe on some of the promises that they made during the campaign because even Thai economists have sort of risen up to arms and said well you cannot actually do this this is economically not viable but I think that's definitely been an evolution from the first taxing government to how you know the po populism or the idea of populism entered the Thai politics and what has become of it up until now and some of the things that taxing has done um, have been things that maybe us in the sort of Western societies um, take as part of the welfare state, right? So um, cheap healthcare, 
um, and you know, um, giving people opportunities to to access certain funds that were not available there before. So, in some ways, defining Thai populism and where sort of the line is between the authoritarianism and populism can be quite tricky. But there has definitely been an evolution in that, and I think perhaps now some of that populism is more the kind of true sense populism that we tend to think about in our sort of more Western concepts, or it looks more like that when you just start dishing out promises about lots of money and things to people just to make sure that you get to power. But now every party is doing that. Or well, most are, not uh, every single one, but most are. Patanon. Patanon, your view? Okay. Um, I will try to answer the question uh, from a student perspective. <laughs> so I I feel like um, populism and authoritarianism kind of meets in the way of like the needs of the elites to maintain the status quo and maintain the establishment. Maybe as um, uh, Dr. Petra and Michael have already mentioned that, you know, uh, since the toxins rise, we see how, you know, the Thai Rak Thai Party and now the Pua Thai Party, they have always been uh, targeting the rural poor, especially uh, talking in a narrative where focusing on how they can, you know, how can they feed um the populations right uh, on the on on the contrary um we see the kind of like leftist um party which is a move forward party which aims to um address the structural um system in thailand uh, and so on and so forth but um eventually we kind of have to really like question these like populist policies. Um, we see a lot of examples, like I mentioned in my presentation, but we also see how um, the Prime Minister Seta recent, right? Like going around in different countries, trying to like promote Thailand as a potential country to like invest in and how we uh, tighten more economic ties, um, with um China, for example, which already started or by the Taksin um era, and he was actually the one who you know first formed the relationships, which you know enabled uh this like conglomerate in Thailand, like the CP and stuff like that. But you know these um these populist policies that aim to help Thailand in a macroeconomic view, like increasing GDP, uh, reducing inflations and uh, and so on and so forth. Does it really meant, is it really meant for everyone in the society? Like for example, another news recently is that the steel, um, like the local steel companies, they, they, they cannot um, run the company anymore because of the Chinese competitors, for example. So in, in a way where, you know, the government's trying to uh, increase the foreign direct investment um, as one of the populist policies, but who are they really like benefiting or rather than like focusing on how to, you know, increase the efficiencies of the workers because Thai workers tend to like fall behind compared to, you know, our like Southeast Asian counterparts uh, in order for them to have a more like sustainable, like economic growth, like in the long run, uh, they turn to like cash handout policies uh, instead. So so I think like we kind of need to like re-question, like re like reconsider and question these populist policies. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um Bulland, have we satisfied you? Th thank you very much for all panelists uh, to, uh, for their answer. It's very enlightening. Thank you very much. Andrea, we'll turn to your question. Uh, yes, it's uh, my question is kind of a follow up uh, to what uh, you were all discussing, uh, because, uh, for example, Dr. Montesano pointed to highlighted uh, kind of uh, how liberalism uh, fits in between authoritarianism um, and, and populism in Thailand, uh, but also uh, Patanan uh, was uh, always referring uh, to populist policies. 
Uh, but um, she was not mentioning that much the relationship between uh, uh, this, uh, the ideas on which those populist policies are based and their relationship with uh, different political ideas, such as, for example, uh, liberal or even neoliberal policies. So I would like to, um, to know uh, something more. What are the possible connections? Because um, she was also emphasizing the stress on GDP growth, the exclusion of uh, some groups in the societies and uh, most of the times the critiques on neoliberal uh, policies are uh, precisely on those points so I wanted to have a follow a follow up on that from all of you uh, of course not only from Vatanam ma'am why don't you take it do you want to go first no, you've been asked a direct question. We'll let that you go first. You have so, you've been full of ideas so far, so I'm sure that will continue. Um, so can I uh, rephrase uh, your question again? So um, the question is uh, to um, understand like the connections between the populist policies and the political ideologies, correct? Yeah, yeah, in, uh, in, to a certain extent, yes. Mm. I um I cannot um I cannot really say like based on my understanding um how these policy pop populist policy are based on which certain political ideology um for me in general like how I view Thailand it's not exactly a liberal democracy and I do not think that even though um you know the parties in Thailand cr claim that they want to be more democratic um I do not really see it happening like in in real in real life for example um like for example, you know, the recent general election um, this year, we would assume that you know now that Per Thai became the uh, government party, we would expect that you know there could be more like transparency, uh, more rooms for raising concerns, like you mean raising like, um, like dissident views, like for example. But those things do not like really change, and. In a way, even though now it's a poor high led government, most of the things still stay the same. Uh, maybe the different thing is that maybe we have an election or maybe Prayut is no longer the government, uh, no longer the prime minister, but he was just appointed to as a privy council um, yesterday. So, so, so in a way, even though, you know, uh, it's a democracy now, Kinda, but most of the policies, uh, most of the ideologies, um, still stem from the military coup and the authoritarianism that has always been persisted in Thailand. That would just be like my my point of view. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Petra, anything to add? Um, I think, I mean, I would just probably just um, really circle back to what you were saying, uh, Mike, before about, you know, this is really, um, I mean, populism in Thailand is really about, you know, where, how, how do you deal with the problem of the people within the elite sort of power relations? And, you know, where do the, where do the people come, come into it? And I think, you know, obviously, um, when Taksim first came to power, and this is where um, I was talking about this, you know, creating this this vision of the the nation economy Taksim brand. So he created this this very different vision about the role of the people and what their role um, in society and in politics was was all about. And that was supported by lots of uh, policies. And you know, th there has always been tension between them. I mean, you know, Taksim wasn't like his his economic policies and things um, were in many ways neoliberal, liberal and his economic policies were not always 
beneficial, as Patana has said, to the people themselves. And a lot of the policies that he was doing on the economic front benefited first and foremost himself. But then there was this whole um, rhetoric around it. And there was this whole, as I called it, the, the sort of the brand that's, that was being built for Thai people that promised something else. And then when you have the more authoritarian governments, again, um, it goes about, you know, how do you deal with the people problem and how do you keep them in their own place so that they do not rise up and do not challenge the, the, the power structures? And I think, again, in that, you know, populism does play a role because you try and give people handouts, you try and keep, give people something um, in exchange for kind of keeping them in their place or hoping that you can keep them in their place without them rising up and without them challenging the the, the whole status, political status quo in Thailand. So I think that's all I wanted to say to that. I have questions for the two speakers myself, but before I... Um pose those questions. Let me just offer two observations. Um, one I hardly need to make for those of you at the European Center for Populism Studies, because I'm sure you know this far better than I do. But, you know, we we, we do need to um, understand or take on board the degree to which, in a Thai context, uh, accusations of populism are ultimately a slur. That is, that is you know, very few people are praised for being populists um and 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 accusations of populism um were largely offered as a critique of Thaksin by people who were on one level simply as political opponents but on another level uh in a way threatened by the appeal to uh the broad mass of the Thai population that he was making that's um one point that i would like to make another point i'd like to make and this this actually speaks to bulan's original question to me which is that you know we have to understand that um and this also relates to to Petra's idea about about the internal aspect or the domestic aspect of branding. Um, in the late 1950s, a Thai strongman came to power, and his central point was that Thailand was going to develop. A development, the 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 priority attached to development became part of, if you will, the national myth. And Thai people were mobilized, both both at the level of rural people who were, in a sense, benefiting from roads and schools and new universities and things, but also the capitalist class, as we see it in Thailand, which was freed up, less dependent or, or faced less competition from, from the state enterprise sector because this was in the cause of development. The difference, however, is that development was pushed as something that would serve the nation. What was implicit in the push was that Thai people would be better off if the nation was better off. What Toxin then introduces is not something that is necessarily in the interest of the nation, but in the interest of the people to whom he's appealing. I will let you be treated for any disease for 30 baht at public hospitals, okay? I will allow farmers to have a moratorium on their debt. These differ markedly from the program of Field Marshal Sir between 1957 or 58 and 1963, which was so focused on development. Now, interestingly, and this speaks directly to what Dr. Alderman just said, there's been some evolution. She mentioned the flagship policy of the new government, which is this 10,000 baht digital wallet. On the one hand, it's a handout. On the other hand, the government is depicting it as a way to stimulate the national economy. Now, is it well designed to stimulate the national economy? That needs to be modeled. We can't solve that problem here this afternoon. But what we can say is that CETA is in many ways trying to have it both ways. He's both saying, here's a handout for you people. But at the time, same time saying, this is not just a handout. We're in an economic crisis. We need to stimulate demand. This handout is going to serve the national economy by stimulating demand. And that tracks very nicely with what Petra just said. 
which is that po Thai populism has evolved in a sense it's become more sophisticated since the fairly crude approach of, frankly, a very crude man, Prime Minister Thaksin. That having been said, and I will, I will certainly allow the two speakers to respond to these ideas when I have passed them the floor. But before that, I want to ask them each some questions. And I'm going to ask these questions of both of you now, not least to give Patanan a chance to think about uh, her answer. Petra, I really just have two, two sorts of questions for you. Uh, two, one is, if you could tell us more about how Thailand 4.0 was pitched to uh, Thai people. And 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 how Thailand people, Thai people were supposed to get on board with Thailand 4.0. That's the first question. The second question is a very obvious one, which is you mentioned the two initiatives of post 1914, 2014 rather. One was Thailand 4.0. The other was uh, the whole cluster of things labeled Bracharat. And the question is, where do the Brachachon fit? The people fit. In Bracharat. For Patanan, I have two questions. One is, I, I want to press you, and I'm sorry to do this, but I want to press you to tell us more about the connection between bilateral trade agreements and populism. And, and what I'd really like to hear more about is how these bilateral trade agreements, you know, you, you said there's this big question of who are the people? Well, what sort of effort was made to pitch these bilateral trade agreements like the Thailand-Australia Free Trade Agreement to the people or to some segment of the people? That's my first question. The second question is relates to the activists who were fighting that gold mine in Pitanulok and Pichibun. Um is it fair to say that these activists uh, used the vehicle of an NGO? And if so, I wonder how you understand where the NGO fits into the evolution, evolution of Thai politics, whether that be an evolution toward ecofeminism or toward, or toward a democracy. That is, at the broad polity level, where do Thai NGOs fit? And let me tip my hand and, and explain to you why I'm asking this question. I'm asking this question because it's my strong belief that actually communitarianism and the NGO movement in Thailand have more often than not in the past four or five decades been conservative impulses than progressive impulses. Why do I say that? Because communitarianism and NGOs have effectively emerged, and I would say have been promoted as alternatives to political parties. And so my question for you is, where do NGOs like the one that presumably organized the activists against the mine fit into Thailand's political evolution in a positive direction should that evolution take place? Big questions. Think about them while we get Dr. Alderman's answers to my questions. Ma'am. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Um, and I'll try to answer them succinctly, which will be probably quite hard, but um, do bear with me. So when it comes to the first question about, you know, how the Thailand 4.0 was pitched to ties, I mean, there were um, different I mean, many different channels. And I do remember I was actually doing fieldwork in Thailand not long after the policy was launched. So it was um, I was there in summer or from summer 2016, and this was launched somewhere in, in the spring. And there was a lot of talk of Thailand 4.0 in the news. There was a lot of talk in like very sort of um, blog posts and, you know, online newspapers. Everybody was like, uh, puzzled what this Thailand 4.0 was. There was often the kind of discussion, you know, what, what is this and how do we actually get here? Um, the government also produced um, many different videos. So if you go on YouTube and you type in Thailand 4.0, there will be plenty of them. Some of the videos are more um, externally facing. So, so 
you know, they're like in English, clearly targeting the outside world. So this is where I'm saying, like, you know, when it comes to nation branding, we typically see that the the external audience is the, the target audience. But then you if you type it in Thai um, or even sometimes I think if you just type it in English, Thailand 4.0, you might find a lot of Thai language video will videos will also pop up. So um, it has been trying to cater to both audiences but um you know there, there, there's there was a lot of the talk about thailand 4.0 on social media facebook um so it was pitched to ties via loads of different channels and uh there was a lot of talk of it um actually uh, suvid was quite prominent in trying to push the idea which was quite interesting to see was that um i mean um with some kid once once he became the the once he became the cabinet minister he stayed in that position for um i think almost the entire time he was under the junta so it was kind of uh migrated from one position to another and this was when um he was the deputy minister the ministry of commerce and this was the 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 height of the thailand 4.0 talk then when he mo was moved to the ministry of science and technology that's when you can see the drop in the the frequency of talking about thailand 4.0 so that's why i think i'm sometimes a bit hesitant to call this even a policy because actually was it ever really truly implemented it more seemed to me like a brand that can get attached to everything and um re in relation to the second question about pracharad i even seen things like talan 4.0 pracharad bunched together in one some kind of thing of something so it really seemed to have served more of this you know brand building and vision building of something that never then truly um perhaps materialized now going back to the pracharad thing um whether the people come into Pracharad. Now, Pracharad was, um, again, something that the, the military government came and which, uh, with this particular thing, it was also hailed as a policy, but then it became an umbrella thing for, or umbrella term for so many different things. But the original um, idea when it came out was that this was a form of a public-private partnership and that this was not a populism. So this was the junta's um, version of populism which was not populism it was nothing like um, what taxing used to do so there was a lot of uh, you know trying to rebrand taxing style populism into something that is a, a junta like populism and the whole idea of pracharat came from somkit um, who was again behind the taxing's economic policy. So he was this um, taxing era economic tar. So he was responsible for all the very exciting taxing era populist policy. So it was the same person um, working for the different government trying to rebrand um, something. Now, this was presented as, as I said, as a public private partnership. And the idea behind it was that, you know, um, people would be given the, the, the help, the knowledge, the know-how, the resources via this public-private partnership so that they can better themselves. So in some, in many ways, it was again quite similar to some of the stuff that Taxin used to do in terms of, you know, offering one million baht um, village funds for people, you know, to take money to be able to start up their, this, the, the, their businesses. And there was a whole mobilization of uh, the business, the Thailand's business sector tr to, to try and join this Pracharat and to try and get that moving. But I think like with a lot of the things that the, the NCPO or the military junta was doing during the, the, the almost five years in power, where the role of the people was, it to me very much seemed that a lot of these things were aimed at depoliticizing people actually and trying to give them reasons to be like, okay, so we're going to give you all this, but in exchange for you to to let us govern Thailand and let us take Thailand in directions that we want and you're not going to challenge us. So I think in many ways the kind of participation or any notion of participation or uh, was quite hollow and a lot of these policies and a lot of, the, lot of these things were very much aimed at depoliticization of the Thai populism and, and, and really saying you know leave it to us we know what we are doing we are the the leaders the benevolent leaders uh, who will take this country forward um just take whatever we are offering you and just do not question us so i think a lot of this brand and that's what i'm saying that um you know this was about um legitimation and and um the pracharat brand was used across i mean even the military party the pro military party that was created before the 2019 um election was called palang pracharat so it kind of transformed from something that was originally like an alternative to tax era populism to something that became an umbrella term for lots of different policies that were just branded pracharat um to then 
um, a whole kind of political marketing strategy for the 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 pro military party. I mean, the, the party is still um, part of Thai politics, um, and the name still keeps going. But I think the the original essence of it has kind of has been diluted and has evaporated, and it just became more of a all encompassing brand term. I hope that answers your questions. It does, and and before we 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 uh, give the floor to Patan, I just wanna I just wanna say for those here who are not so familiar with Thailand, I mean, in a sense, Petra really hits the nail on the head in a very important way when she mentions this issue of depoliticization. Earlier on, she alluded to the fact that the um, hierarchy uh, in Thai society and in Thai politics that has really obtained. Uh, for a long time, was defined formally in the years after 1910, during the reign of of uh, King Chulongkorn's son, around the notion of Tatsatana uh, Pramahakasat, so uh, nation, religion, and uh, king. Now, in recent times, going back 15, 20 years, um, the Thai military actually expanded that slogan. And you began to see posters in front of military bases that said, Chat Sat Ma Kasat Le Prachachon. In other words, nation, religion, king, and the people. The people was added to nation, religion, and king. This was a renewed oper op operationalization of the doctrine that the Thai military developed to fight the communists in rural Thailand during the Cold War, involving working with the people, but depoliticizing the people. And in a sense, this gets us belatedly to a good answer to the original question that Bulent asked, because we see that there is an embrace of the need to work with the people on the part of the most authoritarian institution in Thailand, that is the military. It explicitly focuses, as this new slogan, this relatively new slogan makes clear, on the people. But Rather than mobilizing them to support it in elections, it, it seeks to depoliticize them. Whereas the basis of, of Prime Minister Thaksin's approach, and frankly, the basis of Prime Minister, Se Prime Minister Seta's digital wallet, was mobilizing using populism, using handouts to mobilize support in the electoral arena. Atanan, to you. Thank you. Um, so to answer the first question about the connection uh, between the bilateral trade agreement and the populism. Uh, so um, personally, I do feel that I find that so so at the beginning of the presentation, I categorized bilateral trade agreement as a part of um, macroeconomic policies in Thailand. And usually when it comes to, you know, I mean, it doesn't it's not necessary that these policy are populist policy, but I argue it in that way because of the way that um, political leaders frame it in a way that, you know, if we have this, you know, foreign direct investment, if we have these bilateral trade agreements, um, people like, you know, the people like at the bottom chain will gain more, like they will survive more, they will earn more income, uh, they will be able to lift out of poverty. So in a way, uh, what I noticed um, so far is that um, they always try to link like these macroeconomic policies and the rural poor together in a way that, okay, if we have this investment, you will have more jobs, you will have more income. Um, but what actually happens it's not so much about 
um, the local people that earn uh, the benefits or gain the benefits uh, as a result from these policies. Most of the times, uh, it meant to be it meant to improve maybe um, middle income pe uh, people or um, corporations, for example. Um, during the COVID era, we saw how. Um, can I say the name of the company? Let's just say uh, the energy company. Like we see how uh, one of the en energy companies in Thailand uh, grew so much benefits within like the two or three years. So much benefits that they kind of exceed the, um, you know, the the income, the net growth uh, comparing to, you know, those like big companies like CP, Thai Bif or whatever. And then the question is, why like thailand actually has enough uh electricity generation we have enough coal power plants what happened in thailand is that we have bad um we have bad uh sorry i kind of lost the word um like the infrastructure like we we have bad infrastructure if we only improve the infrastructure, everyone, including the rural poor, will be able to have electricity. But instead of addressing these infrastructure, the Thai government choose to uh, have a new contract with the coal power plants for the next like 25, 30 years. And the question is, but we also pledged to, you know, COP26 pledged to the Paris Agreement that we will um, transition to, you know, a more uh, cleaner energy and stuff like that. And, you, and as I mentioned in my presentations, we see a lot of struggles against uh, coal power plants company, but in government's na narratives, in Thai politicians' narratives, it's all about the local people. <laughs> it's never about like um, the companies. It's never about um, the establishment themselves. It's not about the elites themselves. It's always about the people. That's why um, in my argument, I see that these... Um, national policies that are heavily emphasized on the word like GDP, um, economic development, uh, it's it's not really meant for everyone, even though I consider it's a populist policy because the way how it was narrated. Uh, moving on to the second questions, um, about the activists fighting the gold mine. My my first thought is that uh, how do we define NGO in in this in this space? Uh, does NGO just means like you know an organization? Does it mean just like any civil society? Because in my case uh, of Pijit, right, it's actually one woman. <laughs> who's actually against the company it's not exactly like an in like uh, an organization that mobilized these local people uh, against the company but it's actually a local village girl who has been you know living here for all of her lives and choose not to uh, be expelled from her home and choose to stand up and as i mentioned uh, actually a lot of um homes receive the money company to relocate, but she choose to be there. Even though she knows uh, the negative impacts that are being imposed on herself, her family and stuff. And for and, and you ask how does the NGO fit into the evolution of Thai politics? I would say that um, like for, for me, I do notice um, a different mindset within myself when I was a bit younger in a way that uh, when I was studying my bachelor in Jalonga University, I was studying Axon, uh, liberal arts. So I engage a bit with a lot of like local NGOs, environmental NGOs, and I engage in a bit uh, in activism, particularly pro-democracy pro movement as well. I do see that, you know, coming from liberal arts degree to public policy degree, I see a huge gap in communications and attitude between the NGOs, the people, and the policymaker. I don't think that the NGOs are speaking 
in the same language as the policy makers or the politicians. Um, we can we can see like so many examples. I can give you one. Um, uh, let's say we're talking about human rights, labor rights, right? Uh, if you're coming from NGO perspective, activist perspective, you might only emphasize on um, human rights, labor rights, uh, no exploitation, more protection for these workers. But if you're coming from like a policy maker from the government side, then you might only focus on like how how much uh, money can these workers contribute to Thailand, for example. And so, so, so there is a gap here, but I would also argue that the evolution of NGOs in Thailand is not so much to talk to the government. I mean, it does talk to the government, but these narratives that the NGOs are crafting kind of can compel to mobilize the people more. And in a way, because our system is rigged, we have a lot of NGOs. It's like, it's popping like a mushroom. In a way, Thai government kind of pushed the burden of check and balance to these NGOs and to these people to check to continuously check and balance the government rather than having a judicial um like system that like that regularly checks the politicians, uh, the government officials in a way. So that's why I feel like for Thais. Is really tiring, and for NGOs, it's to create a very like sensitive, uh, dramatic issues like narrative. So to kind of like make Thai people angry to respond to the policies uh, from the government, and and I feel like as a public policy student, I do think that there should be a more like constructive way in discussing the policies, but we still have a long, long way to go to bridge these gaps of communication between, you know, the people and the government itself. Yeah. That's thank a fascinating you. answer. I thank you. I, I have to tell you, I have a it's I have a friend in Manila, another in another country that's seen a share of populism in recent years who actually works for an NGO called ANSA, the Asian Network for Social Accountability. And its explicit purpose is to do exactly what you just mentioned, to serve as a means to check and balance the government. Um, now, we are officially over time, and I'm afraid Andrea is going to tell us that in a moment, but Bulent has a question. So, Bulent, why don't we give the floor to you to ask the question? The two speakers can answer, and then Andrea can wind things up for us. And I'm going to mute myself now for good, thanking you all again for the chance to participate in today's panel. So, Bulent, over to you, to the speakers, and to Andrea. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, actually, I have two short uh, questions, uh, but I don't want to start any discussions. I I, uh, I think that this uh, question is simple, but the answer should be long, uh, but we have no time. But the question is that we are uh, always uh, focused on the, uh, the supply side of populism or authoritarianism or narratives, but also we have uh, demand side. Uh, what uh, people demand uh, what they want from uh, authorities or political figures uh, in political populism framework. Uh, so it will be nice to hear a few words about the demand side of the uh, populism or authoritarianism in Thailand. And another other question, when we are talking about uh, the, the populism, we need uh, other, some others, other or others uh, in uh, Thailand case, uh, who are the others? Uh, Patunan mentions uh, establishment uh, elites and uh, sometimes maybe the, 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 the king family, uh, but uh, the others also need some conspiracy theories. And we know that uh, Thailand is a multicultural country and uh, there, 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 there is uh, Muslims, uh, also Muslim community and also a, a small Christian community. Uh, are these uh, two religious communities uh, the, are the others, uh, others of the uh, Thai populism, or uh, is there another uh, others? I don't know. <laughs> uh, please. Uh... 
making a, a, a assessment about that? I, I can go a little, I can go very quickly and then I will hand over to uh, Dr. Petra. Um, I think because we have more of authoritarianism regime, that's why it kind of rejects the pluralism, uh, kind of rejects the diversity of the society. So in a way, I, I would say that, you know, Thailand should cater to more diversity, like Muslim, you know, uh, the minority people, um, but it doesn't. And I feel like originally populism, when we talk about us versus them, right? us supposed to be the people and maybe them is supposed to be um, the elites, the establishment. But in Thailand, it's kind of like framing in a way that, oh, it's for the people, but it's also actually for the elites and for the establishment. So in a way, you kind of need to like unpack like the narratives, like the myths that the government is giving to the people and how do these like pop populist policy actually, who like who does this populist policy uh, serve? And I think from the demand side, I feel like in general, uh, Thai people just want to have a better, uh, like more transparent democratic process that also do not just value the military and focusing on like the interior, like the Ministry of Interior, but more so on the education, um, the in the equal income distribution, more decentralization, like as uh, Michael have mentioned earlier, not just focusing on Bangkok, uh, but more decentralized policies that, uh, you know, not just Bangkokians will gain the benefits from, you know, the government policy, but also everyone, including the marginalized groups. Now I hand over to uh, Dr. Petra. Thank you. Um, that was a very great answer. Um, just to add on that, I mean, yes, there is, um, you know, demand side does exist for both uh, in Thailand. Um, and you can see how the, the the society polarized as well. So the Thai society has been incredibly polarized since the the rise of taxing. Um, and you know, on the one hand side, there was the 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 the, the pro taxing forces and the people who bought into that um, vision that taxing has created. On the other one, where let's say the more conservative Thais who um, didn't like taxing. And who who were more in favor of the the sort of the more traditional establishment and the role of the military in politics and so on and so so forth. Um, the, the polarization is still there, but the lines of the polarizations um, have been changing in Thailand lately as well because you've got this new group of um, the, the 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 sort of the Thai youths rising up over the past few years, and their demands are very different as well. So you know, their their demands in some ways are a lot more structural than previously because with the pro taxing and anti taxing sides, even the pro taxing side, one of the core demands there was you know let us have elections let us have let us elect somebody who we want to elect and let that person serve the full term um it might not have been all the time so structural but now it's changing into a very structural fight against the whole power hierarchies and power arrangements in Thai society and um the other question which was um so this was the demand and the other again i think that ties into this as well so you know the other has been changing in thailand as well and has been evolving so when taxing rose i mean initially it was on, on the back of the 1997 asian crisis so to, to, to some way um the the west and the iamf that they then came in and tried and imposed you know some kind of economic regime was um added initially so there was a spur of thai nationalism and that served for time being as the other then in some ways taxing then managed to other the old and traditional establishment maybe not fully uh, realizing that he was doing it in in in, in that sense as, as he was going about his own politics and trying to shore up his own um, power um, and then obviously you know after the cool taxing then became the other um, for again so there, there's been a lot of the movement of who the other is depends on who is in power at the moment, the other very much seems to be the, the Thai youth and the more progressive movements and the more progressive demands in the Thai society. So that that's who is being added right now. Um, and, you know, we could have seen that, especially after the 2023 election. But because we are well out of time, I'm going to shut up now and uh, hand over to Andrea. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you to, to you all. Uh, thank you uh, to all the panelists for their very insightful presentation. So thank you very much. And also thank you to uh, Dr. Michael Montesano for uh, its great mo moderation of the panel. Uh, also thank um, to the attendees for the enrichment uh, of the panel with their uh, questions and remarks. I think we had a very nice uh, and interesting uh, Q&A session. Uh, so the last thing to remember to all, all of you, uh, do not forget to, uh, to mark your calendars uh, because we have uh, the next session that will take place on the 14th of December uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, Central European time. Uh, that is uh, the, the next session continuing this panel uh, uh, on populism uh, and uh, is going to be on uh, the state of populist authoritarianism uh, in, uh, in the China. Uh, so focusing on Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar. Uh, so please let keep it in mind. Uh, and uh, remember to register to that panel too. Um, I think uh, we can conclude. I wish you all uh, a great rest of the day. And again, uh, thank you so much for attending uh, and enriching this panel with your remarks and uh, insightful um, ideas. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you all. Thank you. I hope to see you again in future events. Have a nice day. Thank you Have so a good much. Day. Thank Bye -bye. you and you. Bye.